And for all her help in arranging this and making sure that it happened, um, and in arranging all her efforts in arranging for all of our work with Kaplan um, this year. Um, then I want to say thank you to all of you who are here. Uh, it means a lot that you all care this much about our students' future um, and about how what you do in the classroom um, directly affects that. And I know this is a day when many of you aren't scheduled to be here, and so this meant a special trip, and I really am gratified to see everybody here. Uh, and then I'm just going to introduce you to first Mike Powers, who is here from Kaplan and was here to negotiate our spring contract uh, with me today. Uh, and Mike is she's a big. A, she's a she's a high negotiator. Mike Mike is a big uh, puba at uh, Kaplan. I suppose. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. He likens his position to being equivalent to being like the associate dean for academic affairs of Kaplan. Yeah. So I well, I run our institutional, all of our institutional relationships and stuff, in charge of working with administrators. And we actually go back um, with um, the associate dean. And so um, I hail from the area, which, is, which makes it, in fact, I hail from the same neighborhood as the associate dean. Um, so whether or not you like West Rockford or not, I guess you don't like me. But um, the, um, so I'm, I'm happy to be down here and to and help the school. We have two other people who are here on a regular basis. Um, you should feel free to seek any of us out for any materials or assistance that you may feel that you need or would like or uh, would want, because um, at the end of the day, we all have the exact same mission. So our goal is the same as the schools, which is the same as, as the students. So. Yeah, I, I would say it both Kaplan and the law school will be really happy if we can say what we did this year makes a difference. Yes. Yeah, we'd all be very happy. So, and, and so our goal is to try to be as uh, uh, as much of a positive influence as possible. And um, I didn't actually bring enough business cards, so I apologize. But Anne knows how to reach me and reach. Uh, so Candace uh, is our academic person on campus. She's here, runs uh, oversees the class, and has office hours downstairs with the students. Uh, and then Ari is our uh, sales rep. So Ari's the guy who sits at the front table. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> But there, I mean, uh, Anne knows how to reach all of us, and so she can, if you need anything or want anything, you know, feel free to give her a, a note, and she'll, she'll board it on once. Okay? Thank you. That's right. And then Chris. So this is Chris from. Chris and I go way back. Uh, yeah. And, uh, in fact, I brought Chris to CUNY when I was, when I was there. Uh, and it, it's interesting, because as we were discussing who was going to do the introductions, I, I said, I don't know. Chris's bio, all I can do is vouch for him. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, Chris, I've seen Chris teach. I've seen him pull together materials. I've seen him plan lessons. Uh, and he's the real deal. Uh, he, he knows what he's doing. He does it well. He cares about this stuff. Uh, and it makes a, made a big difference the last time I worked with Chris. And I think it makes a big difference that he's part of Kaplan. Uh, and really, really, really glad that he could be here today to do this presentation for you. So, thank you. Chris Frank. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> hello. So, uh, I started off as a Philadelphia district attorney, and I loved that job. I loved everything about that job. It was fun, it was exciting, it was exhilarating, but it didn't pay a lot. And I didn't want to kind of leave and do criminal defense early. And when I was a student, I sat at the table like they have downstairs, right? And I pumped both Barbary and PMBR at the time because my mom, who is a law review secretary at uh, Widener Harrisburg since its inception 22 years ago, said, hey, we got a lot of love, we don't got a lot of money, and I know that if you are a rep for them, you're gonna get a free course in your third year, so do it, that's the smart <laughs> thing to do. So I said, no problem. And you know, I'm sitting at the table, I'm learning about the product, I'm signing up my you know, classmates and whatnot, and I then got to meet kind of the owner of the company then, PMER, because they were also the lecturer, right? And I said, hey, you know, I, I enjoyed my three years, I got my free course, I passed the bar, I'm gonna work as a DA. And she said, well, you know, DAs don't make a whole lot, so would you be interested in maybe tutoring uh, some people on the multiple choice or on the essays? And I said, sure, that's a great way to, to make a little extra money. So I continued to do that 
And then she said to me one summer about three years in, it would be silly not to have you go and teach criminal law or evidence because that's what you practice all the time. So I said, no problem. And by the way, why don't you start to take some bar exams? So that was 10 years ago. I've now taken successfully seven different states bar exams. And oh part of God. the and yeah, and how many unsuccessfully? Um, one. Oh no, I wouldn't have asked that yeah, question. Yeah. Wait, <laughs> who teaches trial practice? Well, Kevin, how did you let me take that? Question? Yeah, <laughs> and, and hey, I have to answer successfully, but I'll tell you why. I walked into Kentucky at that time, you were allowed to do this was in uh, 2002. They had this rolling admission for Kentucky where you could sign up literally the week before. So my boss says, We want you to take Kentucky. Good luck. So I walk in, I sit down. The first essay is on equine law. <laughs> like wild animals, horses, I have no clue. Uh, and the multiple choice, which is what I'm going to talk about, my expertise is really in. It was only worth one third of the overall exam, whereas usually it's worth a half or more. So I can walk in, do well on the multiple choice, you know, kind of BS in the blue book a little bit, if you will, and, and pass the exam. So, yes, Mary Lou, uh, you know, uh, Kentucky was that one that got me. And people then say, do you want to go back? And, I'm like, no, I don't want to. I don't have some <laughs> vendetta against Kentucky. Um, but I do feel like I'm a player coach. I, I've taken seven because when I stand in front of a classroom, I want to command them not only on what they're going to see, but why they're going to see it. I've taken the exam multiple times, and I've taken it recently. Here's what you're going to see. Because really, the bar exam has changed since probably all of you have taken it. Even the most recent of you, it's completely different, and it's continuing to evolve. And I'll talk about kind of its past, its present, and its future. And so kind of giving you a little bit of my background, I'm also an adjunct at six different schools across the country. I live in California. The closest adjunct position I have <coughs> is Texas. <coughs> so my wife, who is due in January with our first, said, listen, pal, <laughs> let this be your swan song for a little bit because I'm going to need you home here next semester. So I'm kind of the, the single ringable neck, if you will, for about 1,000 students at these different schools. About 5,000 essays I'm responsible for having graded uh, this semester, and those students will do in aggregate about 10,000 multiple choice questions. And by the way, this is where the school, as you guys are doing, offers credit to students for starting on these skills now. And I really want to focus on that word skill, because I think if you just give substance early, you don't need a professor for that. But I think that it's really the skill. You know that phrase, it's like riding a bike. We can teach skill now. There can be a six months gap until they take the actual bar exam, but they're gonna remember as they start to put that substance on top of the skill, kind of where that foundation started. And I have goals, I don't have an agenda. <laughs> the first time that I came to a school, the dean of a school in, in the Midwest said, Chris, I want my professors to write multiple choice questions and test on them, and I'm gonna use you to deliver that message basically what happened. It was a three ring circus because I had some professors who were like gangbusters, yeah, let's do it. I had others who said, it's not my job to write multiple choice. Like, that's not lawyer. Like, nobody argues to a judge. It's A, your honor, not B. I mean, you, you do make an argument, but not a multiple choice argument. So I, I get uh, that was truly, you know, the initiation by fire the first time I went out. And over the years, I've kind of changed it up a little bit because I think there are a lot of things that we can collectively do, like increase awareness and appreciation of the difficulty on the MBE. Nobody, nobody has ever scored a perfect score on the multiple choice. The LSAT, the SAT, somebody gets all of those right every single time. The MBE, the highest, we, I just had a student, uh, Scott Hertz down at Ave Maria, got a 187 on the multiple choice. I had never heard of a score that high, but when you think it's out of 200, he's still you know, in the hemisphere, but he hasn't aced the exam. He didn't get them all right. My personal best is a 168. I've never gotten above a 168. And in most states, you need maybe a 130, 135 raw score, and then they're gonna scale that to around a 150. Um, so I usually do well, and my preparation for the exam is simply teaching. All of these classes that I'm teaching, it's uh, you know, it's uh, like Groundhog Day for me. You know, I'm always preparing for the bar exam, uh, but the taking of it, I think, is what's good because I can see what students don't. I can see the trends, what's changed, 
in the exam and about the exam. And I want to talk about that as well. Um, also, the substance of the exam is changing a lot. And two things I want to do for you guys, and I'll, I'll lay this out at the very beginning. One, I'm certainly going to publish my PowerPoint slides to you because there's a lot of information here. And a lot of it, I think, will help you if digested you know, properly over the course of, of, of several uh, sits. But then two, I also want to give you, we have designed for first years, kind of big outlines of multiple choice questions, of the law that's going to be covered. I, I want to show that, share that with you. So I will give you all a, a copy of that as well so you can have for reference because it's important that you know that these are free to your students. I always want you guys to know what your students have. There's nothing worse than someone coming up and trying to impeach you with somebody else's desk reference. I, I, I can't stand that. It happens to me at the podium a lot, so I want to pull the curtain back as much as I can and say, these are the materials that your students uh, will, will have. And then how the questions are assembled, I think that's what's really interesting because, God love them, there's a lot of professors who try to write their own multiple choice. And if they're not test-like and students do well on them, they have this false sense of security that, hey, I did well on Professor So-and-So's multiple choice, therefore the ones on the bar are going to be easy. Well, if they don't really replicate the bar, a, a student, I think, is set up for a, a rude awakening later on. And then finally, increased student exposure to multiple choice questions. And you know that's the, the kind of subtle piece. I don't think, and, and I would not, as a first or second or third year professor, I would never give a 100% multiple choice exam. I would always have some essay, some other component, because I want students to make those good legal arguments. And I can't tell in a multiple choice question if they got it right because they knew it or if because they guessed. Now, I think that knowing what traps that you put in play for students and what they're falling for. Here's a general rule when I was testing on the exception. You can, I think, cull some really good data from that. And that's what we do not only in our four credit classes that I teach around the country, but also in our general bar review. And one last piece, one thing that Kaplan has been doing for I'd say the last five or six years is actually sharing that data back with the school. These are the list of students that took our course. This is the amount of work that they did. Oftentimes, students will say, oh yeah, Dean, I did 4,000 questions. I wrote every essay they gave me, and I kind of show the spreadsheet and say, Joe Smith? No, he did five multiple choice questions. He wrote one essay. He failed to appear nine times of the 15 classes that we had. Um, but rather than just share that with the school, we actually tell on Joe Smith a little bit, right? Or we call Joe Smith up and say, hey, you're falling behind here. What's the problem? Rather than talk to him right after the bar's over, where I can't do anything, we stop him along the way and say, hey, here's an issue. It's either low skill or it's low will. We got uh, uh, methods that will work for either of those. And these classes that I think we're starting, and, and by the way, schools across the country, now that the ABA allows for this accreditation, are partnering with us uh, at, at, I think, pretty high rates, and we're actually seeing a lot of retention. At TSU down in Houston, for instance, this is our fifth semester of offering this. The very first time the ABA said go, TSU said we need you. So we have been retained at, uh, at every school multiple times, and now we're kind of tracking how the students are doing. And from semester to semester, there's usually a group of students who need a little bit more. And then we're kind of pulling those students aside and working on whatever those deficiencies we found in the first semester. So I'm excited about what we've done. There's certainly a lot more things that I want to do. But part of, I think, uh, the process is educating not only the students, but also the people who are educating the students. So looking, looking here at the bar exam, I, I, I think this is easy, guys. You know this. It's, it's two parts. Uh, you know, there's multiple choice, and there is writing. It varies by state, the writing part. Every state has the multiple choice part, except Louisiana. We used to say it was except Washington State and Louisiana. They finally got on board. They now have the multiple choice part of the exam. Louisiana, with its uh, Napoleonic Code, they'll probably never, uh, never fall in line. But what's interesting, more students that go to school in Louisiana take bar exams outside of Louisiana. So you have this, uh-oh, I wasn't prepared for the multiple choice whatsoever because it's not part of my state, and they're going to you know, New York or California where the MBE is a big part. And then the essays uh, range as, as few as five in New York. 
And what's tough about that is there are 26 testable subjects in New York, yet you're only going to get five essays. So then you have the students who want to know, what, what's the percentage of like secure transactions? Because if it's low, I'm not going to study it. So I'm always cautious to kind of say what's not going to be tested. But there are, uh, Spencer. But aren't they mixed topic? They are. Essays? So it's, you don't know in advance whether you're going to get tax, criminal, and secure. On the same essay, they On can the even same throw essay, that right. kind of It's thing. not a yeah. single subject essay. Yeah. And w which is a great segue, or not even segue, but a, a break point, because torts. That's, that's all your essay needs to be about, is torts in first year. And then second year, it's all about essay, or all about uh, evidence. So, you know, judge, there may be ideals of, of criminal law or even tort in the fact pattern, but you want them to talk about the admissibility of the hearsay, or what's the purpose of, of this evidence. Whereas when they get to the bar, they have to talk on all three of those uh, subjects, kind of with the mixed prompts. So one thing that we do in our class is actually give them a mixed subject essay. It's contracts and it's torts. And not only is it test-like, but it's also real world-like as well. Because it's rare that somebody comes to you with just a contract issue. Because oftentimes, it's a contract issue that comes from a property issue or from a, a torts issue. So I think in that sense, we're, we're not only setting them up for success on the bar, but also in practice, rather than just kind of think about just one particular subject. And you know, Oklahoma has 16 half-hour essays that you're required to write. I'm not going to take that one. Gaming law, Indian law, I, yeah, I, have, I have no concept whatsoever there. Um, and then here in Mass, we have 10. And some states outside of Mass have this performance test. And the performance test started in California like 20 years ago. Because California has all these unaccredited law schools. And the deans of these schools kind of said, hey, wait a minute. Nobody argues to a judge, A or B. And these essays aren't necessarily practical lawyering. Why not have a practical lawyering component of the bar exam? Have them write a, a will, a deed, a, a letter uh, to a partner, something that's practical. So California said, you know what, that's a good idea, and they instituted this performance test. Not only did they institute the performance test, but they said, let's give them two. And instead of it being 90 minutes, they're three hours long. So California is difficult because of the length of the exam, three days, whereas New York is difficult not because of the length of the exam, it's only two days, but the amount of different subjects that students are responsible for. Mass doesn't have that performance test component to their exam. However, in a lot of classes, you want to be mindful of who your test takers are. So certainly if we have people who are taking New York, for instance, where there is a performance test, that may be something that we want to, uh, you know, at least know about. And so here at UMass, when we teach our class, it's more mass essay based. But if I'm teaching it in, let's say, Springfield at Western New England, uh, I would say that probably 40% of their students actually take New York or New York and another state together. Therefore, it's important to talk about the, the performance test. But again, knowing what your students are going to see on the exam, I think is important. And uh, the mass exam uh, essays are scaled zero to seven. So you have the six MBE subjects plus a number of state-specific topics. And um, by the way, um, evidence in criminal law, I forget your first name. Hillary. Hillary. Hillary said, hey, I'd love to know kind of two things. One, how is evidence in criminal law distributed on the multiple choice? But also, how is that distributed on our individual state essays? I will give all of you um, kind of a, a uh, a bar graph that shows those for all of your topics. It's very simple. The National Conference releases that for the MBE, and the we've tracked that over the last 20 administrations, so we can actually show you kind of the frequency of, of testable areas as well. Because one thing that I'm going to uh, share is the importance of kind of mapping your curriculum versus what potential areas are tested. Does anyone here teach property? Okay, good. No, I'm going to pick on property. In property first we year. <laughs> in property first year, I spent, I would say, six weeks on future interest, and I went nuts. You know, fee simple determinables, uh, condition subsequent, possibility of reverter, right of reentry, all of those things, right? You cringe. You're thinking back to first year. Thank God I don't teach property. Um, it's now maybe two of the 200 questions on the actual MBE. 
Whereas mortgages is probably, you know, some people say as much as a third. I see an easy eight or nine questions on mortgages. My guy, God love him, never taught us mortgages. So the two days in bar review that I had in property and 20 minutes of that was mortgages, that was the sum total of my prep for those nine questions. <coughs> I was ready for those two future interest questions, but really, you know, kind of time invested for points returned, we got the model upside down. So mapping kind of what's tested is big. When I took my first bar, Pennsylvania in 99, in criminal law, 25 of the 33 questions were in crimes. The other seven or eight were in criminal procedure. Now it's a 50-50 split. Now Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment is half of the entire criminal law pie. So the less important the amendments are, the more important. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, would be, I was wondering if the increase in mortgages is a result of the financial debacle. Are, they, are the mortgage questions more oriented to some of the problems that we've had in the foreclosure of mortgages? Yeah, and however, <laughs> I'm actually going to go the opposite route and say, I think that because the National Conference changed up their approach, our financial situation started because literally they went to mortgages about eight years ago yeah. is when we started to see this uh, increase. But when I'm teaching mortgages, most people now kind of shake their head because they realize about foreclosure, about short sales, about, uh, you know, now I can't just go after the property and REM. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to go over the, after the guy because the house isn't worth what he bought it for. So I think people are kind of appreciating that a lot more. But we're seeing a lot more uh, mortgage questions that also cross over with like a land sale contract. So kind of this intersection between contracts and property is a big area. In, in fact, the National Conference said they felt that contracts as a whole has fallen in its percentage-wise lately. They didn't say where. So I'm kind of saying to professors, hey, this is an area that I think we can really start to, to uh, put a crutch under. So this like if the headlines were driving the exam. Well. No, and here's why. Yeah. Because the exam is written probably two years after the headline. So now, some of the newer questions could probably take on, you know, a, a, a Fannie or a Freddie yeah. feel, if you will, right? But I think that um, I think that mortgages is just an area that, for one reason or another, has has become. It. Think about it as a practice area. It's a much bigger practice area. No, who practices future interest? Yeah. You know, nobody hangs a shingle and says all I do is future interest, right? But mortgages is something that affects, you know, a, a large percentage. My family's in the real estate business, but everything is underwater. Every every transaction. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So uh, we can get you to write some good, uh, <laughs> good property questions there. Um, so let me let me move on. Uh, just showing you kind of the breakup of New York. Okay, I'm not asking for kind of hands of when you took the exam, but the exam changes, right? Uh, February 1972 was the first time that the MBE was introduced, and only 19 jurisdictions adopted the MBE as part of their exam. Before that, it was all written, or the state provided its own multiple choice. Uh, July of 72, we had another seven states join up to, uh, up to 26. And then 79, uh, New York joined as number 49. Now, that's not 49 out of 50 because you have, you know, Northern Marianas Islands, you have Guam, um, you have the Virgin Islands, you know, all of these ones that I'm, you know, volunteering to take, right? Uh, Puerto Rico, uh, but the exams in, the in Spanish, yeah. In the winter, of course. Um, July of 2009, there were, uh, we had uh, 53 jurisdictions. And currently, we have 55, all but uh, Louisiana have joined. So the, the NCBE is, is really um, uh, kind of the ivory tower. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of jurisdictions that, that fear them a little bit because they're moving toward this thing called a UBE, a uniform bar exam, which basically takes, takes out of state's <coughs> hands everything, right? Except for pass rate percentages, really. Um, they would uh, write your essays, they would write your performance test, and they would administer the, the multiple choice. So there's a lot of kind of big states. I think New York has toyed with this idea a little bit. In fact, maybe to, to some schools' detriment because they snuck in a non-New York essay. 2010? Last, 2010, yeah. Uh, but California is kind of the stalwart. California says, hey, we're not buying that. We're gonna be the master of our domain. However, the National Conference just did a study that it would save California in administration fees going from three days to two days and allowing them to do it, something ridiculous, like two and a half million dollars per administration. In California, you want to talk about being underwater, you know, <laughs> figuratively and, and hopefully not literally soon. Uh, California is having tremendous financial problems and that may be, you know, hey, cut a day off this thing, save us three million dollars. 
Um, I just wanted to say when you mentioned Oklahoma in the three days, they <coughs> took me back to when I took the bar exam in D.C. after doing some three days you know, in the summer. Each day was like 95 degrees and there was no air conditioning in the place. So wow. it'll revive memories of basic training at Fort Benning. And there's your Eighth Amendment fact pattern, right? That's it's right. cruel and unusual punishment. Um, so the original makeup of the exam, it only had five subjects. Civ Pro was one of them back in the day. They've since gotten rid of Civ Pro, but now it's rearing its head again. They're probably going to test civil procedure again in 2013. So uh, we are ramping up, writing questions, getting ready to release it. 2013? Yes. 2014, sorry. 2014. I forget what year I'm in. <laughs> um, and then later, you know, we had this traditional kind of big six. Uh, criminal procedure now kind of falling under criminal law but being half so really in seven because criminal procedure has taken on really a, a subject of its own and kind of the breakdown there are 190 live questions there are 10 that are test questions that don't count toward your score and this is new it used to be all 200 were live now there's only 190 that are live and think about this in each administration to a year there are six different exam numbers so 12 exams per year, 10 questions per year, 120 guinea pig questions they are trying out every year that don't count. And I have recently, I took Arizona and Colorado in the last two years, and on both of those exams, I answered a question that's, that, that my answer, I don't know if it's correct or not, I chose the word redemption, right? That's completely a wills-based issue, but it falls under property. I also granted summary judgment in another area. And so there was the kind of the Civ Pro that they're moving in. And the National Conference says that they think that multiple choice is a way of testing knowledge for basically any subject. So they're toying with the idea of certainly adding civil procedure, but also secure transactions or wills and family law. So this is, again, kind of where they may be uh, going. You know, they have conferences all the time. And, uh, you know, we sit in on them and kind of listen to, uh, you know, what direction they want to move in. But the breakdown typically, uh, those 10 test questions. So, so and some students may say, I swear I saw 15 mortgage questions. Maybe they did. Maybe eight of those were live and the other seven were the test questions. Who knows? Because they're indistinguishable. And it's a real perception issue. When a student goes in, they're looking for what they feel comfortable with. And if they don't feel comfortable with a question, there's gonna be an overwhelming feel that, oh my God, all I saw was mortgage questions, right? <laughs> and where were the criminal questions? I was ready for homicide all day long, and I didn't see a single one of them. Well, they were on there, but you were just overwhelmed by probably the mortgage ones, for sure. Um, I'm gonna move through the next 22 slides that give you a breakdown of where the subjects are tested because I can literally put that in a, a nice little sheet for you and, and you can look at that. I think that's the whole mapping piece that I'm talking about. Um, but it's gonna look something like this. So criminal law is gonna be crimes against the person, crimes against the property, the habitation, and then criminal procedure. In those areas, elements of crime, mens rea, actus reus, defenses, uh, and then, you know, assault, battery, murder, different types, manslaughter. So I give you one of these across all six subjects. And also I kind of give you uh, the second part of it um, is what I call what's hot right now. What has been recently tested that I've seen, that I've heard anecdotally from students there was a lot more this way. But then also looking at what the national conference releases, where are their questions kind of fitting into uh, more particular categories. Because although they tell you what percentage comes from this area, there's no way to test that. Believe me, this is, an uns this is a secure exam. We're only gonna test eight homicide questions, but there's no way for you to really test that unless a judge says, you know what, there's an unfair exam, so we actually wanna see the breakdown. Like that's the only way you would truly get to know what the breakdown was, you know? To know what's in the ocean, you gotta drain it. They're, they're not gonna do that. Uh, you gotta kind of get word for it. So I will certainly provide that uh, by uh, subject as well. Uh, but this is an important slide. Because I do a lot of private tutoring, and also, you know, it's more bang for your buck. I only have 14 weeks with these students, so I have to hit big ticket items. I'd love to win the rule against perpetuities for two days. No, not really, I wouldn't. But it's not worth it because it's maybe one question tops. 
I'm going to spend my time on landlord tenant, on mortgages, on protection of individual rights, on hearsay, on homicide, because 90 of the 190 are going to come in these basically 10 areas. Two, four, six, eight, yeah, 10. So, and I'm sure, Judge, you're hitting character impeachment, you're hitting hearsay, right? You're, you're, you're covering those areas well, but that property situation I gave you, future interest isn't up there. Yet we spend likely six weeks on that. And I'm not saying we have to change that at all, not at all. But I think it's important that we kind of know in our curriculum where big ticket items fall and where they don't. Because we may want to have an upper level mortgage class, you know, one credit, something like that. We go around and, and do things like that. Yes? So if they were going to add civil procedure, I mean, what do you think they're going to pull from? What are we going to see? Fewer hearsay? Where Negligence gonna... goes to 10. Uh, hearsay goes to 10. Like, that's the way they would do it. I don't think they're going to take that one question on, um, on the Eighth Amendment away. Uh, but I think that they will start to shrink. The problem is when they start to shrink, there becomes less of a relevance for hitting these kind of big ticket items. And then like everything's a possible testable area. So I fear that a little bit because it really dilutes this, but right. hey, Dean? So, you know, two things. One, and I'm sure Chris will talk more about this later, but one of the things I've discovered is that, for instance, in the area of character impeachment, students who could never get that if they did seven QBank questions in a row on character and impeachment, they started to see it. Um, the, 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 the kind of where they floated in and out, of merging the two subjects and that kind of stuff. If you, if you, so that's just one argument for multiple choice, helping students to nail concepts in a way that they might not when you're talking about it in class. But the second thing is the more subjects they add and the more the more this gets spread out, this list of multiple choice stuff, the more this part of the test becomes a test of the skill of taking multiple choice questions and the confidence that you bring into that test, which is why for me this meeting is so important. Because you do not get better at multiple choice by wishing that you were better or by taking 200 questions in a day, how many seconds for each question? 1.8 minutes. 1.8 minutes. You don't get better at multiple choice that way, and you don't get more confidence. So unless we do something here, our students, many of whom are not good multiple choice test takers, are facing a really uh, impossible burden. And it, it's very interesting. Um, we were called into Tulsa uh, recently because their students were doing five points lower on the multiple choice than any other law school in Oklahoma, which allowed them to strike that, which allowed other schools to fail a complete essay. Remember I showed you there were 16? They could fail one more essay than the Tulsa students because they had those extra five multiple choice points as that buffer area. So Tulsa said, we're at a severe disadvantage. We came in, we offered a 14-week class. They went from number three in the jurisdiction to number one. Now. There was this, you know, I'm not going to take credit for that because there was a shift from the administration through the professors to the students to focus on multiple choice where they hadn't before. So my class certainly helped to bring that focus, but I think the faculty said, we don't necessarily have to start writing every question in multiple choice wise, but we can certainly support students taking a class that is going to focus on the skill uh, behind that as well. And I think when you put numbers in front of people, here's why we're deficient, here's how we can get better, it, it, it really gives them kind of that push to say, all right, let's, let's make that focus. Yes, just briefly, you know, the homicide thing, it really surprises me. I mean, I, when I teach criminal law, I teach one crime, homicide. I don't cover arson and all the others, right? But 10 questions on homicide? So here's what they're doing. That number, I think, is, is a little high. They're actually testing homicide within cohates. So it's attempted murder. It's conspiracy okay. to commit murder. So I, I can't really separate those uh -huh. out as much. And also, we're getting a lot of murder as a wrong answer choice by lack of causation. So maybe there's actually an aggravated assault, but something else killed the guy, right? right. So right. it doesn't become a homicide, but that's like the trap answer. Okay. So, and, and by the way, rule against perpetuities is a wrong answer like seven, eight times. <laughs> but students say, oh my god, I've seen this like ten times. It's got to be right. So they start picking it, right? <laughs> Um, I, I thought this was great. I, I, I seek uh, student comments all the time. 
Uh, for the essays, I felt well prepared. The MBE was extremely tough. I had trouble with the questions that asked you to pick the best answer. When there are more than one, what I felt was right answer. It wasn't a question of knowing the law or having more time. Having all my books there wouldn't have helped me. I wish I would have had more practice narrowing it down to two and choosing the best one. And I think, you know, Dean, that really speaks to your point too. Like, this kid was smart, but it wasn't because he didn't have the smarts or even a book in front of him. He didn't really know how to approach these types of, of questions. Whereas an essay, that's what we're, we're born to do, right? I'm gonna argue this side, I'm gonna argue this side. And it's all about partial credit. Sometimes the best students really are at disadvantages because they see the nuances and interstices and problems that others don't. Exactly. And they're always looking for a trap. Always looking for a trap. So where a question should be easy, they're looking for you know that second le level of analysis to make it a little bit more difficult. Um, so so different ways to integrate or some problems, obviously, we talked about these. It doesn't accurately test knowledge. You can't give partial, partial credit. The student doesn't show their work. It's kind of viewed as a shortcut, it's not academic, it's certainly not lawyer-like. But the benefits, I think, are you know, early exposure, uh, new technique to existing testing methods I'll talk about in a minute, kind of enhances the classroom experience. The ability to use not just a multiple choice, but let's say a fact pattern. Take a multiple choice question and strip out the answer choices, just give the prompt, the call, and say you write the answer. What, what would you look for in this particular situation? Cover up the four answers, What's your gut tell you the right answer should be? Admissible because it's a present sense impression. Pull it back, is that answer there? And I think exposing it early, maybe after you've covered a, a you know hearsay, for instance, rather than the first time they see it as part of their final exam, it's daunting. So it's also a great way to use clickers in the classroom as well. You know, you get that Im immediate bar graph. I like clickers because a lot of students who are fearful of raising their hand, who went with A? <laughs> If A's wrong, I don't want to raise my hand, right? So I'm probably going to keep it to myself. But my clicker will, you know, anonymously represent that A, and we'll actually see A's the trap, guys. So for those of you who went with A, here's why it was wrong. So I think there's a lot of, of good use, rather than just as a final or just as a, a midterm, but actually using it to kind of stop and make sure that your audience is with you. Did they get what we just covered? Uh, certainly, it's going to increase. Uh, pass rates because they're exposed to it, they realize the importance of it. I think a lot of students come into the multiple choice with this false sense of security. Oh yeah, I did well in school, so I'm gonna do well in the multiple choice. That's not always necessarily true. Um, again, you know, how to prepare students, really hitting big ticket items, you know, that mapping the curriculum that we talked about earlier is critical. They're introduced to the process earlier, part of curriculum, um, it can be midterm quiz final. There's a lot of schools who seek us out and say, hey, we want to purchase from you secure questions. Because I've had the problem where some professors will borrow a question now and again and use it as part of their final, but I'm like, well, we'll talk about the copyright stuff aside from that, but you realize that your students may be using those same questions to practice, so you're defeating your own purpose. So we've started to kind of put aside a bank of questions that students can't get to through any kind of commercial purchase um, that are used. In fact, uh, the Infolaw Group, Charlotte, um, Phoenix, and Florida Coastal have actually bought, we, we, what did we sell them, like 2,000 questions? We can't use them anymore. They now own yeah, those questions, own. so we took them out of, of circulation, and they're using them on their own um, at, at their school. Um, and you know, certainly you could leave it to academic support, but the problem is that I, I think academic support is inundated with all of these other issues that students have, and, and, and <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of them aren't just about learning or just about what you need to know to be successful. I think a lot of it is you're a, you're a personal counselor as an academic support person and you're really hemorrhaging in, in that role. Or dedicated class to bar prep, and, and obviously I'm an ad advocate for that, but I, I stand here not only as an advocate, but as somebody who has really bought into it because it's me. And when I'm at these schools, I actually see students doing better. I, I hear their arguments. I see them being more engaged, and it's uh, efficacious, right? Because they are doing better on the exam, or at least it's a placebo because they think, I'm now comfortable with multiple choice when I get into the exam. It's not daunting, I'm ready for this. Now, when they get in there, they know there's gonna to be tough questions, but I think they have a, a more of a fighting chance than they would have without it. And we've seen a lot of success in our uh, 
uh, our, our bar preparation classes. And hey, you're getting credit for studying for the bar early. I mean, I mean, students, you know, glom onto that. Different types of uh, multiple choice. These are kind of some things you can use in class, uh, requiring explanation of all answer choices. So oftentimes, I will give a student four answer explanations and not say which one's right, but say, tell me why A is right and why B, C, and D are wrong. I would give them partial credit because I want to hear their argument. So I'm exposing them to multiple choice, but I'm also having them show their work. Uh, have them write the answers. Give me two for yes, two for no. Give me two arguments why this would be admissible. Well, it could be an excited utterance, or maybe it's a present sense impression. And then it, it's, you know, it's used for character rather than hearsay, or it's not for its truth. Like, students actually writing them, again, it gets them working with the nuts and bolts of the exam. Have them write an essay on the fact pattern. I, I do a lot of that issue spotting based on a, a fact pattern. Make seven or eight answer choices. Some professors do that. That one is not as, as test-like, so I, I kind of pull back on that one a little bit. I think you know a lot of professors will use five. I think five's the max I would, I would use. If you want to be truly test-like, it's four. And um, I like this one. List them from best to worst. Because I think oftentimes you can make arguments like, hey, this is an admission by party opponent, but it also could be maybe a present sense impression. Which one is preferred? Is, is, is one easier to be admitted than the other? Or we're lining up the powers of Congress. Well, certainly this would be uh, uh, fall under the Commerce Clause. But also you could make an argument that it's also uh, tax and spend. We've seen that <laughs> recent, uh, uh, not tested, but recently. Yes, well, Justine. If I did list it, um, you said already number four isn't actually on the MBE. Are the other ones on the MBE, do they do that? No, not at all. Not at all. But should we do, are you saying we should not? No, I'm saying that these are good ways to kind of use multiple choice. Okay. So you can use them traditionally where you give them a multiple choice exam, but you can also use a multiple choice question to squeeze the juice out of it. Like take number one, require them to explain all choices. So I give you the test, you pick A, but tell me why A is right, and tell me why B and C and D are wrong. But I've heard that if we're not doing our multiple choice questions on the exam the way the MBE sets them up, then it's not particularly useful to test multiple choice that way. You're saying you're, no, you're no, no, disagreeing no. with that, I guess. Not at all. I, I, I think if you're going to write multiple choice questions for an exam, yeah. they should be test-like. My argument is okay. that you don't have to use them for just a test. You can use them yes. in multiple different ways throughout the, throughout the semester. Because I think some people fear the notion of just introducing multiple choice. So I'm trying to find kind of a, a middle ground of how the problems people have with multiple choice could actually be rectified. Dean? So also, this demystifies them for the students mm -hmm. and really helps the ones who are getting over anxiety. If we start giving bar multiple choice questions in the first year, we, we don't, you don't need to teach. I can tell you who's gonna pass and who's gonna fail. Um, our students need to learn how to take multiple choice tests and get confident with multiple choice tests. They're, they're not good at them. They hate them. Sexual, uh, I mean, stereotype threat is, is getting in the way of them answering questions right on multiple choice tests. They're, they're smart, bright, great students. They all underperform. And I would say, except for maybe five students in the school, either they underperform on multiple choice tests or they have no business being in law school to begin with. And I believe they have a business being in law school. So this is all about, we have to take students who think that whether or not you can pass a multiple choice test is coded on your genes, and that they don't belong to that gene pool. They never had a multiple choice test that gives them credit for what they know or what they can do. We have to turn them around in three years into people who feel otherwise. And you don't do that just by giving them questions they're going to fail on. So this, all of this stuff is part of kind of breaking that. And really, guys, they've taken four standardized tests or three standardized tests, and they bombed every single one of those, some of our students. And it, so it's a lot for us to break through. So everything we can do like this is going to make a difference. Yes. So um, one of the things that uh, that might help with first year is um, handing out 
a packet of questions like I did, I've done it once I have enough material under their belt for, to be able to do that. Each semester I hand out a packet, maybe the fifth week of classes, and we start doing one or two a week in this packet, and we deconstruct, because yeah. I'm not good at the questions myself. Um, so, so we can take a question or two, and we can read it, we can go over the answers. Well, what's a stupid answer? What could, you know, what's a trick answer? What can we eliminate it? Just work with that, and second semester I do the same thing. So they have gone through, not that many, you know, maybe 30 questions together as a class. I've never done, I've never done these other things you're suggesting. Um, I've never made them do the questions and turn them in. We've done it just as a group in an informal way, exposing them to it, so. And, and, and it's, it's like volunteer work. Like, I don't care what you do, just volunteer in something that you like. Like, get exposed to it, and I think, it's quality that you're doing. It's, it's not, you know, you've done 3,000, you will now pass. Like, no way, I, I literally squeeze the juice out of them. Take that same one and use it multiple <coughs> times. Make sure that the students are, are with you. Because yeah, there are tricks and there are things to know. For sure, and classic and wrong answers, yeah. yeah. Hillary. I mean, just in terms of squeezing the juice, one of the assignments <laughs> I give students is to write a multiple choice question, nice. right? With, with a answer, or with an explanation of all four answer choices. You know, if they're great. I'll buy them. <laughs> then, I'll, then I'll use them, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, but um, I want to ask you about timing a little bit. So yeah. when I am giving a quiz or a portion of the multiple cho on the exam, multiple choice portion, so let's say for a midterm where they really haven't, except maybe on their own, done multiple choice questions, you're, you talk about on the bar exam, you know, you're simulating, so it's one, one minute, eight seconds per question. Actually, it's it's 1.8 minutes, so it's probably about 94, oh, 95. Oh, okay. No, all right. Yeah, closer to closer to like 105, okay. I guess seconds. Almost two minutes. So I sort of, yeah. I've kind of come out with a formula just based on experience of about 20 questions for about an hour long test. Oh wow! So, and I don't know. And that's 33 worked. per hour is the pace that you're on for the bar exam because you have three hours to do the 100. Now. Depending on the difficulty and the length of yours, right. that may be a completely appropriate number. Keep in mind that the and you know let's 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 get to it. Um, I'll, I'll go back and, and show you. But this is this is kind of an average length. This is actually a release question. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to talk about like no K types, right? Which is like one and two, but not three and four. So this is what the national conference has recently released. This is a K type in sheep's clothing. The man's. Uh, wife uh, who came home and saw her house had burned and had a heart attack. A firefighter who died. Both the wife and firefighter, neither the wife nor the firefighter. That really says one, two, both one and two, neither one and two. But they've just put words to it. So, but that's about the length, a very short fact pattern. So two minutes is just enough time to get it right or you knew just enough law to get it wrong, right? You, you kind of give them enough rope to hang themselves because you, the more you spend on a question, the, the chances are that you're going to get it wrong because now you're you're overthinking. You know, Judge, you said about some of those smarter students overthink. But Did, let me do one thing about speed. You, you you have to be able to do them untimed. Yeah. Before you can do them timed. So for first year. When so you and right and you've got to have a lot of practice to get faster mm -hmm. and a lot of confidence to get faster. So I, I think we might disagree a little bit. No, about completely this, agree. But but until a student can get them right with all the time in the world and their books open, right. <laughs> yep. they can't get them yep. right with their books closed. And then they can't get them, and then getting faster means doing hundreds of questions. And then they get faster. They build the group. Yep. So Hillary, I first year, worry at first year. Clock off, clock off. But you've started them on this process so that when I get them in general bar review, Last year three, I can put the clock on, and that's the only catalyst well, because the red. I can't turn the clock off. I'm saying I'm giving this as part of an exam. Oh, uh, 20 in an hour is fine. Like, yeah, that's good. I mean, I have to. Is that a good number? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Strict. You know what? Turn the strict the bar strict clock time. off. So yeah, words, yeah they have to do it in a certain time. Yeah, I think okay. that's plenty of time. If, if your fact patterns don't go more than, I'd say, two paragraphs. Right. Okay. okay. Because if you're going more than two paragraphs. It, it's, it's a little untest-like, uh -huh. because you're probably adding facts that are irrelevant. The bar has really moved away from irrelevant fact usage. And they're getting down to almost all one paragraph. But Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, writing questions. Procedure, form, and substance I want to talk about. Procedure, 
pick a high yield topic. Don't write a rule against perpetuities question because it's not high yield, right? If the, the brunt of your evidence class is about hearsay, then give them a down the pipe fact pattern about hearsay. Now, you can make it difficult. You can have two answer choices that could both, you know, you could make arguments for, one ultimately right. But don't pick some quirky kind of, you know, the last bar I took, there was a question about where one of the answers was the Third Amendment. And I'm like, I know the first. I know the second. My dad taught me the second. I know the fourth is a DA. The third? D did they repeal that? Quartering troops in wartime. Now, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the testable fact pattern, but it was in a wrong answer choice. When I'm teaching students, I'm like, it's kind of like food in a foreign country. If you don't know what it is by looking at it, don't eat it. Okay? Really? And if, if you've studied for three years and three months and you still don't know a concept, it's probably not the right answer. And what, you're impeaching yourself, your own credibility, in the most important exam you took. I have no clue what this is, so it must be right. That's terrible advice, right? So uh, develop the fact pattern. That, this is kind of like how I write my questions. So the first thing I do is I say, you know what? I want to test landlord tenant specifically where lightning destroys the property and the tenant now says to the landlord I want you to rebuild so I start with kind of a concept in mind and then I'm gonna build my fact pattern a enters into a two-year lease with B the landlord everything goes great for the first six months he pays on time then there's a winter storm and you know the house is destroyed by fire and lightning like I'm gonna develop my facts I'm not gonna add extra facts in then my answers kind of what to add Obviously, you want to have a rule if there's an exception, and you know, hearsay comes to mind very easy because hearsay, you're always going to have one default answer, inadmissible as hearsay, not within any recognized exception. And then you give a couple other exceptions. Oh, present sense impression is good. Let me add in a dying declaration, and I love to use that one because dying declaration requires the declarant to be unavailable. Now, the student gets down there and says, oh yeah, dying de declaration works but they forgot up above that the declarant was actually there. So that's a beautiful trap question because instinctively they like that one, but they've forgotten a key element. So I like elements that are there. I like answer choices about elements that are missing. And think about this, negligence for instance. An element that's there is good, but an element that's missing is better. Joe wins because he was owed a duty by Frank, that's good. Joe loses because Frank wasn't the cause of his injuries. That's better. And it's black letter law. They kind of walk right through it. Yes? I was just looking at your thing there, and you could throw in there the presence of an insurance policy with a very vague, open-ended thing that, that might be relevant even by the landlord and the tenant. Absolutely. Perhaps an affirmative duty on the landlord could have taken the insurance and didn't. Have or you an, add an a statute. Insurance, an insurance policy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You, so you can add that. You can also add a statute in that maybe defines Hillary homicide in a slightly different way than you've taught in class. Because the bar exam, in my mind, is a marriage of skill and substance. And one of those skills that's critical is reading comprehension. On the last exam I took, 66 out of the 200 questions had a statute that I had to read. They're not your friend, the, the, the people writing this exam. They want to give you the definition of burglary because it's different from what you have memorized. Oh, maybe you forgot the definition. Let's help you out. No way. It's going to be slightly different. They've taken out nighttime. They've taken out breaking. There's something different about it. But then that trap answer is going to say there's no breaking. The statute didn't require breaking. And you defaulted to what you had memorized rather than what was hidden in plain sight in front of you. And then, of course, explanations. I think explanations are important to use. One comment, one of the things uh, I have done in constructing multiple choice questions is to look at the restatements and take the illustrations. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and think about this. You, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I got my, you know, my, my big, you know, Kaplan, you know, sweatshirt on today. I go around and I, I talk on behalf of Kaplan. But the bar exam doesn't have Kaplan's outlines and Barbie's outlines and whoever else is, and they're pulling questions from their material. They go to a horn book. They go to a restatement. And a lot of the mortgage questions I've seen are very similar to the ones that I've seen in, uh, in restatements as well. So I think that's a great place to either take it or model something after a hypothetical that, that's been given for sure. The good thing is 
after the exam if a student is arguing with the answer. Boom. There is. <laughs> <laughs> Impeach this, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Very <laughs> ominous. <laughs> um, this, my friends, I share with you, this is what I use to write good questions. Here's how, here's how you get it. Reading comprehension triggers. Age. age. Little Jimmy, comma, age four. That's totally relevant because either he's not competent to testify, either he can't be held to an adult standard, maybe he enters in, well, I guess he's a little young to enter into a contract, but he's a minor, so we know that his contract would be void of bull. Like, his age is of critical importance. Uh, it, it also works in, in constitutional law. Maybe he's being discriminated against because he's four years old. Now, maybe he's only a rational basis plaintiff, but still, age is a critical trigger, a factor that you need to write into your fact pattern. Um, somebody's skill, right? Joe, comma, a, a, you know, a skilled plumber, right? The fact that he has that extra skill, or a professional race car driver, I'm gonna hold him to a higher standard. Bill, a doctor, hey, when he's doing some life-saving measures on the street, I wanna see that, uh, that doctoral expertise come through. His skill is important. Uh, status, merchant, a friend. Okay, friend, I don't know them any duty. Oh, but if this is my mom or it's mom and the son, now there's some importance there, some familial relationship between the two. Uh, knowledge and experience, again, that kind of goes with skill, but oftentimes they will tell you, little Jimmy come age four, who's smart for his age. Well, they tested that in the guise of a <coughs> um, um, attractive nuisance, right? So a, a little boy, typically, because of his age and experience, can't appreciate the danger with a trampoline or with a swimming pool, and he enters onto the land and he's injured. But if you've got a kid who's a little smarter than the average kid, and we'll look at that extra expertise on behalf of the child, that would be a good fact to add in. Uh, unavailability and evidence is a big one as well, because we have these 804 exceptions that require the declarant to be unavailable. They're terrible answers unless my declarant's unavailable, period. They're, they're, they're just wrong. But students fall for them all the time. I get a little fired up when I teach this because it's the same way I, I work with students. Like, if you see what the traps are now, I can't tell you what the right answer is, but I can tell you what things are going to trip you up, what the wrong answers are going to be. And then intent. I love that in crimes and in torts because they will tell you, Joe, comma, not intending to kill, shoots a gun in the air, and Bill dies. And a trap answer is going to be premeditated murder. Well, he didn't intend to kill this guy. So look for something else. Um, and then purpose. Purpose is so big in evidence. What's the purpose for which this evidence is being offered? Is it for its truth? Is it for the limited purpose of impeachment? Those things, I think, are lost in a fact pattern on students very easily. Uh, writing them, a question should be concise. Uh, often, you don't even need a fact pattern. And I will show you one of these that's been recently released in a minute. Avoid K-types, use common nouns. You all remember the exam where it was like Joe and Sally and Bill. Joe and Sally and Bill have left the building, all right? <laughs> it's now a baker, a cook, and a chef. I think because the National Conference doesn't want anybody remembering their questions. And if they all kind of blended together, oh, it was a, it was a fact pattern about a chef. Did it have anything to do with food? No, not really, he was like mowing his yard. Like, it, it's, students can't remember it afterwards. And then they can reuse their, their questions. But also, I think it makes it easier in a sense, because sometimes we'll say, plaintiff, defendant, witness. So rather than over Joe's head you put P, or over Daryl's head you put D, now it just says, plaintiff, defendant, witness. So it actually makes it easier. At the risk of asking a dumb question, what's a K-type question? Oh, one and two, but not three and four. That's a K-type question. Yeah. One they used to do with Roman numerals, so there'd be four Roman numerals, then no, four letters. No, they're, my favorite. Yeah, you, but, you, but, but here's the but deal. Yeah. You can use them. Yeah. Tell students this isn't test-like, but you can still use them to, to walk through fact patterns in multiple choice. Like, it's not test-like, and if you're going to write questions and say this is exactly what the exam is going to look like, you stay away from it. But I think our, our combined effort here is that exposure to these in general is a good thing at but you're saying they don't have those in the bar exam? Not at all. Why are they called K-type questions? Um, that, I have no clue. Um, There'd be a problem with that in Washington, because everyone's going to think of lobbyists. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, if, you, if you read any, like Susan Case is the director of testing for the National Conference, they're actually called 
K-type questions. Maybe because there's, do you remember when we learned English in grammar school, we did, what was that stuff called? Um, Sentence diagramming. Say again? Diagramming sentences. Diagramming sentences. You know, you have, you know, this one and this one, but not, not these two. I, that's my best uh, guess, but K-type is, is what they call them. I call them Roman numeral questions, because I think that's what the vernacular people understand. Um, question? No? Uh, concise. About questions. <laughs> oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, there, there it is. Uh, we talked about this one, common nouns. Uh, language. Pretty much all of your questions now are two for yes, two for no. Pretty much two for admissible, two for inadmissible. Two for constitutional, two for unconstitutional. Two for guilty, two for not guilty. So the, the parallel. Or all for, like it will say, Joe is being tried for homicide. He is found not guilty. Why? So they tell you a conclusion. Rather than ask you to come to one, they tell you why. And then it's really what's his best defense is, is what you're being asked. Volunt uh, you know, he, uh, he was justified in killing. He uh, had a reasonable mistake of fact. He was insane at the time. Like, they're going to give you basically four defenses. Hillary. What's the attitude about putting the, um, the, the rules in the answer? So, like, inadmissible because it's improper character evidence as opposed to inadmissible because or yeah, I've never seen a question that would say 404A2, okay. but I have seen questions that use, you know, like responsible because his acts were foreseeable. So it's using that word from proximate causation. So sometimes they will use the rule, but a good question, if you're going to use the rule, not the actual federal rule, right? But if you're going to use the rule um, in its in prose, in language, I would have he wins because the mailbox rule, he loses because of the mailbox rule. But now, what that's done is it's polarized those two. So now A and D, if they were B and C, A and D are irrelevant because now I know it's <laughs> either the mailbox rule applies or it doesn't. But I actually like that because now the student has said, this is my issue. Now I rely on my knowledge of the law and they either get it right or I don't. But I go one step further. I have parallel parallels. So two that are on one parallel track that's wrong and two that like so these two are about character but really it's an issue about hearsay so these two are opposite and these two are opposite so did they get the right issue and the right rule that's what i think makes a really good multiple choice question and i'll show you a couple of those um, ifs ifs and unlesses we've done away with you may have just answered my question uh, is the yes if no unless question bad form Bad form. Why? Because it's not test-like anymore. I still think it's good to talk about yes unless. Oh yeah, there is this one exception. But the test doesn't use ifs and unlesses anymore. And in fact, it took us. We had to mine through 8,000 questions. And you don't just change if to because. The entire thing shifts because of that kind of almost double negative that the no uh, uh, if or yes unless provides, you had to really gut the question and, and replace with another. That was painstaking and it was also expensive to do. And they're taking all the double negatives out. The, double, the yeah. obvious double, double yeah. negatives. Yeah. But negatives are still good, which is the right. least strongest argument. Like that would be in there. Or which of the following would not work as an admission. But the double negative, yeah. So your fourth example up there, use, use of for all, I can't read that. Use of four, all with ifs. I have so seen. So no unlesses, but you can still use all, do all four if you started with if. I've seen a couple, not too many, but I've seen a couple where it wasn't if and unless interspersed. All four were ifs. Why does Joe win? Uh, or does Joe win? Yes, if he can show this. Yes, if he can show that. Yes, if he can show that. If I were you, I would completely, <laughs> I, I wouldn't use an if or an unless in anything. Yeah, because they unless do. Unless I decided. They've said Unless I decide. <laughs> if. They said they're taking all the facts out of the, the new, new introduced facts out of the options. Absolutely. So th they may not have gotten all the way there yet, but they're on their yeah. way out. Yeah. No introduction of facts. Now, I here's what you can do, though. Yeah. You can write a follow up multiple choice question, though, right? <clears throat> You can have another one where the fact pattern looks the same, but now instead of the defendant being 14, he's now 28. So you know how before you would have written B, yes, if he's actually 28 instead of 14. Excuse yes, sir. I, I've read articles that suggest the better form of question 
is one that starts the first part of the sentence to the answer. Uh, Joe is guilty because. So all you're doing is finishing, the student right. is finishing the right. answer. If you look at what they've released and what they test now, there is not a single question that is, there's not a single prompt that starts that doesn't end with a question mark or a period. Like there are no bifurcated, you know, start of the question is in the prompt and the end of the question is below. So it'll be yes because, da da da, no because, da da da, inadmissible because, da da da, inadmissible because, da da da. Like I'm with you and, and you know, I have to kind of, I, I write right handed, so I have to put that behind my back when I'm writing questions because I think some of these historical pieces still do bear fruit. But I have to write, especially for bar review, as test like as I can. So my prompts are all closed. You know, everything is a single question. Uh, you're not kind of completing a, a thought. Questions covering a variety of tasks. Um, check this one out. What is the most accurate statement? I've seen this. It doesn't give you a prompt of torts, contracts, crimes. Look, an initial aggressor, that's crimes. Uh, Congress cannot legislate to prevent, that's con law. Uh, a contract for the sale of goods, that's a uh, contract, statute of frauds. And then D, a remainderman, that's property. You've just mixed four subjects in a single question. I saw a question recently that said, where do the federal rules of evidence not apply? And it said something like admiralty cases, bankruptcy cases, um, courts of uh, uh, military courts, and then um, maritime law. You either know that or you don't. There's no, oh, let me look at the facts here. And I think that's kind of a BS question. I, I don't think it really tests anything other than pure memorization, right? And you can guess and get it right. Was it just an example? No, the question, because uh, I actually rewrote one like that. Um, the federal rules of evidence do not apply in military courts. However, the military court mirrors the federal rules, and in fact, six months after a federal rule comes into play, it's automatically part of the military court, but it's cited differently. It's part of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Exactly. Parallel with the federal courts. Yeah. yeah. But when I saw that, I was like, ooh, you know, let me, let, let me, let me get this one out there. Let me see something like that. Um, things to think about when writing questions. Reading comprehension, length, style, and format. You know, I say this is not your father's bar exam. It's really, it's really changed in a lot of ways. Um, trends, what is hot, uh, lean on me for those. I want to get you those uh, kind of mapping areas, if you will. New versus old concepts. Changes in, in con law and criminal procedure. Uh, I think most of us, when we had evidence, we had it pre uh, Crawford, you know, the change in the confrontation clause. So historically, a deeply rooted hearsay exception was sufficient to beat uh, a confrontation clause argument. And, you know, the court kind of said, wait a minute, hearsay is good, but like you got to have an opportunity to cross your accuser. So that's going to be kind of the ultimate bar. There are still questions that are, that are still wrong answers that talk about kind of the old law. And I think that on a practitioner's exam or somebody who's practiced in you know, Oklahoma for 20 years and now wants to take the Florida exam, that could be problematic because you know, there's, been a, there's been a change there. Um, here, this whole open-ended, uh, the, the stem, the open-ended <coughs> stem is bad, but the open-ended cause of action is good. A asserts a claim against B. What will the court decide? A claim. Are you kidding me? When you go out into practice, a sues B for, and here's how much he wants, because you can't answer a complaint unless you know who's suing you, what they're suing you for, and how much they want. But the bar exam isn't going to tell you A suing B for negligence. You're going to have to say, oh, this is more negligence than it is intentional torts, and then wrong answers are going to talk about intentional torts. Or if you give them A sues B for battery, I love a trap answer that says, oh, this injury was not foreseeable. Because in my mind, that's going to go to a negligence cause of action. But it gets a student to kind of ponder and say, yeah, this isn't foreseeable. But it should have been over here in your negligence analysis. Reading comp, you should have circled battery. So they're good uh, uh, testing distractors as well. Jurisdiction. The bar a lot of times will test a minority position by telling you A wins. And you thought, based on your knowledge of the majority position, that A should lose. 
Well, if A wins, it can't be because the majority position applies. Now I'm looking for a minority position, the opposite answer. They're really tough ones. And usually they give you a statute that pulls from that. And then, again, the statutes, it's really about an interpretation. Um, the jurisdiction would be obviously state courts, not federal courts. No, it's the other way around. It has to be federal court on the multiple choice part because that's the same everywhere. Now, the only place they're going to put you in, uh, or they could give you a state statute, but you're not required to know state law for the multiple choice. But is there sharp divergence from state to state in, a, in the federal jurisdiction, presenting from the area rule? Um, well, they're not testing civil procedure, so... It's a jurisdiction. Right, so what I'm saying is they will say, this jurisdiction has adopted, or this jurisdiction oh, you're, has you're the following... you're using in a sovereign term like Exactly, that. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Whenever I see jurisdiction, I think federal courts. Right. right. Yeah. So this is a good one. Uh, a woman loved to play to watch her neighborhood football games. According to tradition, when a player scored a touchdown, he would immediately rush at a fan and jokingly tackle her. I love the word jokingly. One Saturday, as a woman and her neighbors are enjoying a game, the guy scored a touchdown. He looks for his little brother, intending to tackle him. She's standing uh, over there. She looks in his direction, she's exhilarated, and she jokingly calls out, come on, big boy. And that's exactly what he does. He runs full speed over and tackles her. She's like, uh-oh, I, I need to get out of the way. She gets injured. She now brings suit again. Suit, for what? Negligence, assault, battery, what is it? Attractive They're hiding nuisance. the ball here. Attractive nuisance, right. <laughs> so, A says, no, because injuries sustained during sporting events are foreseeable. And I think students say, yeah, well, that's true. Well, one, it's not foreseeable to a spectator, right? Maybe the guy who gets tackled on the 50-yard line is expecting it. But then you're like, wait a minute. What's your gut tell you this is about? Negligence? Whoops, I tackled. No, he intended to do this. So I'm going to get rid of an answer choice that speaks to negligence. And A speaks to negligence. My gut tells me this is battery. And I got a prima facie case sitting in uh, D. There's my elements. Harmful offensive contact. But B and C, opposite, yes and no, give me a defense. Consent. Well, at first I like C. Yes, because she didn't expressly consent to the contact. Well, I think there's an argument to be made that <laughs> come on big boy is expressly consenting. But you see how myopic this is? Because there's also implied consent. And then I hearken back to the facts and say, neighborhood football game, tradition, she's there. She knows what's up. She didn't just step onto the continent for the first time and she has no clue what's going on. There's implied consent there, which is a defense to our prima facie case. So D isn't bad, but B is better. Like, that's a beautiful question because it has all of those things in there. And it really, that's the squeeze, the juice. You can spend a half hour walking through that with students and you know they know the law and the testing when they're done with it. Levels of difficulty, there's three on the bar. I would say that 50% of the questions are level two. 25 are easy, 25 are difficult. I get in the exam and I look at some questions and I laugh and I say, B, I'm not gonna waste any time on this thing, it's too hard. But I think sometimes people get to an easy question, you know, A smacks B in the face. Is it, you know, a First Amendment violation? Is it battery, is it murder, um, or is it fraud? Like, what was the one we just saw? Oh, I would say that one's probably a two. Okay. I would say that's probably a two. Um, because you have this general rule and defense, or general rule and exception. That's what a lot of them are, and they're presented in the same fact pattern. Sometimes the exception or the defense works, other times it doesn't, but when you're presented with both of them, you really have to walk through that full analysis. Uh, and then level three, I wouldn't write those. I just plain would not write those. Um, if, I'm, if I'm doing benefit, I think, for my students, I, I wouldn't write things that are that hard. Because always think about it this way. Can you explain it in a couple sentences? If you can't, if you have to break out a horn book to, to find the law, then, and again, test what you teach. Don't go, I mean, I am critical of bar review companies that write questions beyond what their professors teach. How was I supposed to know that? The dude I just listened to for four hours didn't make mention of this at all, and then you tell me, oh, I failed my test, why? because I applied his law to something that wasn't testing his law, like that's, that's ridiculous. So really, whatever you teach, test against it. What to avoid? Obscurity, uh, obviousness, tricky devices, that double negatives part. That's not test-like. 
and puzzling, like, which of the following is not the least wrong answer? <laughs> we saw questions like that on the bar 10 years ago. You probably remember some crazy calls like that. They've gone away from it, for, for good. I, I have a lot of negative about the exam, but that's one good thing I think that they've really cleared up. The perfect wrong answer. Opposites, you know, this yes because of the mailbox rule, no because of the mailbox rule. Uh, general rule versus exception. Uh, the parallel tracks I talked about, like two that talk about confrontation clause, two that talk about hearsay, because they have to kind of say, all right, I'm at a fork in a road. Do I go left or right? And if I go left, I didn't have yet one more fork, right? Is it this rule that applies or this rule that doesn't apply? I think it also makes it easy for us to write answer choices as well when you, when you start with that form. Reading comprehension, not in a, in a uh, call or good, because I think students read so fast that they miss words like that. And rather than looking for the best, they're looking for the worst. Or rather than looking for the worst, they're looking for the, the best. And the important part is that you can then afterwards, you can teach against that. You went with B, and here's what you were thinking about. Like, I don't want to know that I got it wrong. I mean, I do, but I want to know why I got it wrong. Why did I pick that? Because if not, I'm just banging my head against the wall, getting questions wrong. Show me why I got it wrong. And if you're writing it with that in mind, you can then teach against it. And I think both substance and skill really get uh, delivered simultaneously in that form. So in terms of the why you got it wrong, I mean, what do you suggest we do in terms of going over the exam? You know, if we take a session and put it up there like you have it and go through the questions and talk about it in mass, sometimes students go a little crazy and start yeah. fighting. Then they can come, or they can come and review in our office. I mean, do you have a preferred way? Do these students need to own these answers after they take this test, or are we okay that we don't give back the majority of our questions? I like them owning anything that they're practicing on in class. So take 20 questions and write them and use them in class that have lots of explanation and really go through and, and, and squeeze the juice out of those. And then what I like to have is because the, the majority of students are not going to come to you, and it's sad because the gunners will come to you. You know, those top 10% that got two questions wrong, they want to see those too. But that bottom 10% who got all of the questions wrong, they never come see you. Our class really seeks those students out and really forces them to take exams that show why you're getting something wrong. Because I think if we go in not and look at a lock with them and say, boy, this is your problem. But we have key. Here's the problem, right? We've seen that you missed this question, this question, this question. It was because of reading comprehension, lack of black letter law, or, or this. Like, I think leaving some of that part to us, either in bar review or in our class, is good. Setting them up for multiple choice in general in class, I think, with you is, is, is best. And here's the other thing. These questions are hard to write. If you have, if you release answers, it's no longer secure. And my, uh, you know, I don't release mine. I will have a student come and we will talk about it, but I'm not putting that out there because then I have to write 50 new questions. And I constantly look to see, I want my students to be getting between, you know, 60 and 80% of every question right. And if I find that only 10% are getting it right, boom, it's gone, I release it. Or if everybody's getting it right, then it really doesn't help me, right? Because I really want to see striations across my questions. I want them to fit into that 60 to 80 range. So when I, when, when I know exactly how that question's performing, nobody's getting that, because that's gold to me, right? Because I can reuse it, and I can also really teach against that question. Good? Cool. Um, so reading comp, uh, correct but irrelevant. I love that one. And I'm going to show you some examples. Mm -hmm. Inserting an exception that is not tested factually, because how do they memorize? general rule and exception. They memorize those two. So when they see the general rule, they're thinking about the exception they're looking for. But if it's not tested, it's a correct rule of law that's not being uh, shown to them. Um, so here you can see C and D. Yes, because expert testimony is necessary. C, no, because it's not necessary. That's the parallel track that I want them to get it down to, and then they're going to have to figure out a, a rule of law one over the other. And I'll actually release these to you if you want to kind of play around with the, the fact pattern. Uh, you, you certainly can. I just want to show you some examples of these. B is a general rule. Nothing because contracts of minors are avoidable. But C, when we're dealing with necessaries, that's our exception to the general rule. So B, general rule, C, exception to it. Don't fall in love with the truth. 
Yes, because the plaintiff bears the burden of proof in the civil case. That's true, but it has nothing to do with the fact pattern. But you're running low on time. It's it's there in A, and you fall in love with it. That's a problem. Oh, that's that's a correct statement of law. But what's it help with? What if you're running out of time in general? You tell students anything? You just say C. You pick whatever you want to be uh, your guess answer I and see. be consistent with it. Mm -hmm. Some bar review companies say, hey, when when you don't know the answer, pick C. And they're like, and then everybody will pick C. Like. But we're teaching our students to get the question right, not to guess wrong. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that flies in the face of logic. Um, and I love this one. The man and woman are joint tenants in A, B. The man and woman are joint tenants in, in B, C. Tenants in common, D. Tenants in common. So there's that parallel track. Is it the A, Bs, or is it the C, Ds? And even whenever you get it down to the CDs, you have to then take one more step and say, does it encumber the entire property or just this part? Um, Teacher question, if you will, on the question before this, the uh, that one, the easy, obvious trap was A. Is there a reason that that was the first answer often? No, I I like to put traps in A sometimes uh, in general bar review because of timing, because students see something real fast and think, oh, okay, I can get a point here. No, it's it's going to be mixed. The the trap is going to be hidden on the bar wherever they want. And I know uh, I'm getting close on time. Uh, this is a great question on the mailbox rule. I say reading is fundamental because A is applying the mailbox rule correctly, but the mailbox rule doesn't apply in this situation. So you could have gotten it right for the wrong reason. This is a beautiful teaching question. It's a good testing question, but this is one that I wouldn't test in a final exam. This is one I would use in class to really uh, explore just don't think you know the answer. Make sure that you know why it's correct. Uh, one better than another. This is beautiful. So here, judge, this juris jurisdiction has a retreat statute in effect. So they've told us that, right? And C says, no, because the duty to retreat only applies when deadly force is being threatened. And here it's not being threatened. And you're like, OK, yeah, that's good. But then D is just a little bit better. No, because the patron used reasonable force and was not required to leave. <coughs> That's a more perfect answer. And when I teach that, I say something like, you know, Professor Cleary, do you like ice cream? Yes. What's your favorite flavor? Coffee. Coffee. What describes him better? He likes ice cream or he likes coffee? Certainly he likes coffee is more specific. C is ice cream, D is coffee. It's more specific, it's a better answer. It goes a little bit further and hits the entire process. And again, I love students to get it down to C and D, and then the eureka moment becomes, yeah, you know what? He didn't have to retreat, and what he did was reasonable. It's a more It's almost as if the judge were asking a question. D would answer the judge's question more. Exactly. More fully. Yeah. Perfect. And then statutes. This is a release question from the National Conference, which I think is weird. Three for yes, one for no, and the no doesn't give an explanation. Students are, are, are deathly afraid of that. No, why? <laughs> well, and, and here they actually, a common law jurisdiction defines first degree murder as, and they tell us either by poison or by premeditation. Here, she gave him some laxative, which isn't poison, and she premeditated his discomfort, but not his death. So students think premeditation, and then they like B, because she acted with premeditation, but not in bringing about the death. So the answer actually is no. And here's the problem. She did something wrong. And this guy's death was caused by it. But you're not asked, like an essay, discuss or explain all possible crimes. You have to pick one of these four. And that is polarizing. Future of the exam, civil procedure, wills, trust, secure. Fewer per subject. The importance of skill increases because the mastery of substance does not guarantee you a high score. And Chris, just on that last question, which anybody who knows logic could have figured out the answer to, it's one of the issues is whether kids come in with that rhetorical, logical framework well settled before we apply the law to it. For sure. And, and I think many students do not have that coming in. Uh, so we look at that and we can answer that question whether we know that law or not once we read the statute. But for our students, having the statute there may not help if they haven't had training in that left brain thinking in a rigorous way. 
and it makes, I think, classroom exciting because you get more people involved that perhaps typically wouldn't be involved. And I think they see early on, I'm either getting this or I'm not. And if they're not, they can reach out to us and kind of say, hey, I need a little extra help in, in this particular area. Now, I think it also helps us to see the people who are underperforming and do something uh, about it as well. Uh, so it's kind of uh, MBE in, a, in an hour and a, you know hour and a half, there's a lot there. I wanna provide you guys uh, afterwards with my email address if you have questions. More than happy to share with you anything that I have in, in, in the stable, uh, for sure. Whether it be questions, whether it be kind of how I approach things. Certainly, I want to put some materials in front of you that your students are going to have as well. And really, just start a relationship, start a partnering. I, uh, as I said, I'm that single ringable neck for seven schools. UMass being one of them. I don't teach all of the classes here, but I'm certainly responsible for the curriculum that's in front of your students. So uh, the more that we can partner towards that collective goal of them doing better on the exam, I I'm all for it. So thank you. Thank you. Did I pass Kentucky? No, I told you. <laughs> yeah, what's the loss? Uh, at the risk of really imposing on you, would you be willing to look over some of our choice exams? Absolutely, absolutely, for sure, for sure, for sure. And you know, I, I, I don't, uh, there need not be kind of anonymity because some people are like, oh hey, I don't, I don't want to give him my multiple choice because it'll rip him apart. No, I, I think there's, there's benefit in any multiple choice if, if, if done correctly, so I want to champion kind of the, the effort of, of doing that for sure. Any other? Uh, yeah, theme? can I, I just want to tag on to say, Using multiple choice questions in class, low stakes, no stakes, is a great way to figure out whether they learned what you taught yesterday. And, and sometimes I used to do, the first one was just the statements of the law, right and wrong. And the second one added in a fact. And the third one tested the exception. So we did yeah. three multiple choice questions, and in three minutes I would know how much they picked up from yesterday and where I needed to start. And also that's a way for, for you to start easy with the one, with yeah. kids who have no left brain confidence like that right. Right, and work your way up. Yeah, where do they fall off? Right. Like the evolving fact pattern, yeah. the, the, the growing and difficulty yeah. fact pattern. Right. They were with me at one, they started to fall off at two, I lost them at three. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is there any, you mentioned you skipped the exceedingly difficult questions entirely. It is, is that the type of thing we should be telling no. students? No. I do it because I want to spend time with all of the questions. I want to saturate my brain with everything that I'm seeing. I want to pass the exam, but I want to walk away with a deeper appreciation of a trend. So if I see something difficult, that the only benefit is that it was a tough question, it doesn't have value to Chris from the educator. Well, but every you know, one of the 200 questions yeah. has value as a single point to our students. They should spend the appropriate amount of time and move on, but realize that in a fight, you want to hit that guy more times than he hit you. But he will hit you. So you will see ones that you have no clue on. Spend the appropriate time. If you're lost, pick your guess answer and move on. But you should attempt them all. There's still no penalty for guessing. No penalty for guessing. The only penalty is if you fail to put in because you lose 25% chance of getting it right by guessing. But George, you're asking questions that people who test well need to know to pass the exam. And smart, and right, and people, for, for most of the people we're teaching, those tips aren't the difference between them passing and them not passing. It's really learning how to think logically, under pressure, in high stakes situations. We all got into law school because we were good at that. And to put a finer point on things, so I'm teaching at Western New England tonight, and I'm delivering their midterm exam. They had 50 multiple choice questions that they did in two essays over three hours. The top score was 40 out of 50. The bottom was I'm 10 Mike. out of 50. So think about that. 20% to 80%. A 60% delta between the bottom <clears throat> and the top. And so this kind of bottom quartile, I then have a second class next semester that deals just with those students because I students. really use it as kind of the, the sieve, right, or the same, whatever it is. You know, I want to I want to shake the water out and see what I have left, and then work with those students individually. On timing, is there any validity? My approach is I give them a practice exam or two, give them three minutes per multiple choice question, 
by the time of the midterm, I'm giving him two minutes, two minutes, 20 seconds. They're about, it's almost like athletic training. Exactly. By the final, I don't get the first year to 1.8. I do that for electives, upper class, but my final is two minutes. Is there any validity to, to? I, I think there is, as long as you're not having this precipitous drop off. You know, if, if it's gradual, I think it's okay. But like if you see them just fall off because you've, if, if the only thing you've increased is, or decreased is the amount of time and it now becomes impossible, then, then I think you're not, you're, you're setting them up for the timing of the exam. But really, if you want to teach them foundational things, you know, pull that, pull that number back a little bit. But if, if you find that, you know, as you, as you increase the heat, they're running faster and they're, and they're still staying within the lanes, choose them up. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? I will email you guys. I haven't carried Dan's card.